And covering war in 1993, eventually founding Combat Films and Research in 1997. Bill Billingsley spent much of his time documenting numerous global hotspots, including Abkhazia, South Ossetia, Chechnya, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Western China, and Iraq, splitting his time between producing documentaries, writing, and lecturing. Uh, Beyond the Borders, a series of, of films of international scope produced by the Kennedy Center began airing in fall 2004 and in spring 2005. You can learn more about all the Beyond the Border films at beyondtheborder.org. In 2003, Dodge was a, a finalist for the prestigious Rory Peck Award for Best Feature for his film Virgin Soldiers, which follows a squad of Marines from their base in Southern California to the end of combat operations in Baghdad. In 2002, his film House of War won the Rory Peck Award and the Royal Television Society Award for the Best Feature, documenting the battle for Kuala Jangi Fortress in Afghanistan, where he was one of the few foreigners on hand um, at the prison revolt that took the life of CIA agent Johnny uh, Mike Spann. Months later, months later, he was also among the few to document U.S.-led Operation Anaconda in Afghanistan's shah e Valley, air assaulting into the valley with the soldiers from the 101st Airborne Division. He's currently working on a book and documentary on the operation commissioned by the U.S. Army's Foreign Military Studies Office. Billingsley co-wrote, uh, directed, and produced Immortal Fortress, a look inside Chechnya's warrior culture, which was a film that took him deep into dangerous war-torn breakaway regions of Chechnya to document the insurgent perspective. Prior to that, he produced numerous programs for the Discovery and History channels that explored weapons and the changing na nature of warfare. Mr. Billingsley is the past recipient of the MacArthur Foundation's Regional Travel Security Grant for his work in Abkhazia, and he's lectured on various security-related topics for the U.S. Army, Air Force, Navy, New York Military Association, and numerous academic institutions, including the Kennedy Center, Columbia University's Harriman Institute, King's College London, Monterey Institute, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies at the University of Arizona, and so forth. A frequent contributor to various defense and security related journals, including Jane's, uh, Jane's Intelligence Review, Journal of Electronic Defense, and the Harriman Review. Uh, his latest article appearing in that latter titled Weaponizing the Story, Chechen and Russian Media Operations, 1994 to Present. Um, Billingsley received his BA in History from Columbia University and an MA in War Studies from the King's College Department of War Studies in London. Uh, the title for his presentation today, Life Along China's Korean Border. Please join me in welcoming back to the Kennedy Center, Mr. Dodge Billingsley. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Corey. It's always good to be at the Kennedy Center, back at the Kennedy Center, this progressive institution here in this otherwise conservative world. Um, and I kind of joke about that, but I was walking by the quad, and there were these, these shirts that looked like it was che, Guo, che, che, and then I thought, no, no, that's Karl Marx, and I realized it was Brigham Young. <laughs> and they used the same sort of psychedelic imagery kind of on it, and I thought, wow, that I've never seen before. So I thought that was really cool, and I probably only see that at, at Brigham Young University. Um, now to the topic at hand. Um, the title, and I changed it a little bit since we, we decided on it, was Life on China's Korean border, and a second title, Korea, the Last Divided State. And the reason I added the second title is because a couple months ago, I went with Professor Heyer to take a walk, or basically look around the Chinese, uh, Korean, North Korean border, all in part of a program that we're doing for the, uh, the Beyond the Border series on Korea being the last divided state. And all along, as we've looked at this idea of doing a show about the Korean Peninsula, we're not really sure how much access we'll have to North Korea, and it's hard to tell parts of that story without it, but there's a strong Korean, ethnic Korean identity on the border on the Chinese side, and so that's why we took this trip. So I'll explain that. Um, I just want to just do a little bit of the factual stuff right up the front, right up front, so we kind of know where we're all at. China has what's called the Anbian Korean Autonomous Prefecture, and this is the map of China, and it's in Jingling Province right here. And in, within Jingling Province, it's that red dot. So it's relatively small, but there's 850,000 ethnic Koreans that live there. Where is it? Right there. And within this red dot, there's eight districts in the Anbian Korean prefecture, autonomous prefecture. And um, that's kind of where we're at as far as like location. Also, to let you know, when I think about the Chinese North Korean border, I divide it personally into three phases or three places. 
You have the Yalu River border here, which there saw a lot of fighting during the Korean War. You know, uh, we bombed the Yalu portions of the Yalu River, the Chinese counterattacked across, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have this sort of mountainous zone, which isn't necessarily as accessible, and you have places like Heaven Lake in this area. And then in the north, you have what's called the Tumen River area, Tumen River border, and that's where this Korean autonomous prefecture is. So that is the area of our travel right there. So it's not a lot of space, but it's important to the Korean story. The first thing, and this is the breakdown now of the eight different districts. And again, I don't mean to overdo it on factoid type things, but I want you to sort of see where we were. And the red zones are the zones that we traveled in. And I'm gonna go through that. The first stop was Yanji City. And these are aerial sites of the city and just, just images that we took. The first thing that surprised me was that we were greeted in Korean. All the signages in Korean. The music in the Korean, the taxi drivers, the ones we got were Korean. They spoke Korean, which is great. In fact, I have to say one thing and back up. Traveling with Eric Heyer in China is wonderful because he's so fluent in Chinese, but when it came to speaking Korean, we were both at a lot, obviously at a loss sometimes because he doesn't speak Korean. Um, but it was a really interesting trip. Also find out that it's, it's, there's direct flights from South Korea right into Yenji City, which I was surprised to find out. And all the hotels cater to Koreans. Now this would be South Koreans because they have freedom of movement, they have freedom to travel. It was really, I didn't expect it. I don't know necessarily what I expected. And let me say one thing about these kind of trips. You can, I like to read and do, your, do the research ahead of time. But then I feel like if you get on the ground, you can actually look for things to back up your facts. And this goes anywhere around the world in any type of topic. And sometimes you see things differently. I'm not going to become an expert on the, on the ambient area, obviously, in a week. But you get a sense of, you get your own sense. And then you sort of work that into the facts and the research and the documentation. And you can, you can come up with a strategy and you know, how you want to actually study and tackle a project like this. But um, the other thing, the other two things were the North Korean connection. There wasn't any. There was no visible signage, propaganda, posters, uh, reference to the North Korean regime. And we're only miles from the border. And that was a bit of a surprise as well. And maybe I was just naive, but I thought there'd be some reference. There was a, obviously the whole city was ethnically uh, related to Koreans, but not as per a regime, even south nor, south nor north, which is kind of a, a bit surprising. I think we expected a little bit different. Finally, there's a very strong remittance economy going on there. Just like uh, people here in this country uh, from Mexico would send their money back to Mexico, to their families in Mexico, or Bangladeshi workers working in Dubai will send money back to Bangladesh. The difference here is ethnic Koreans are going to South Korea to work to earn more money on the South Korean economy, sending that money back into the Yanbian, uh, the Yanbian prefecture. And so you have this uh, strong remittance economy. In fact, what was interesting is when we had the chance to talk to different people, in almost every case, elderly Koreans in the area would talk about that their children or grandchildren or both were all living in South Korea or had lived in South Korea at some time to work and earn money for the family ask a lot of the older people, the soldier's generation, why they don't go to South Korea. And they said, well, we're happy here. The life is easy. South Korea, it's all hustle and bustle. It's all about money. We don't want that. But they're happy to have their kids make this money and send it back for a better life in China. So it was, it was just really interesting. Um, you could drive in any direction from Yanji, and you turn up in these Korean villages. And you, the architecture is different. Um, the whole setup of the villages are different. You could tell a Chinese village from a Korean village and just drive into it. And that's what we did. We didn't want to pre-select anything because we just want to go to random villages. And so we went to one that was new and wealthier. It looked wealthier. And we went to one that was kind of run down and went to some in between. And again, we were hit with sort of the same sort of um, testimonials. In fact, one kid we met, he was probably in his mid-30s, said that he had just returned yesterday, the day before we had talked to him, from working in South Korea for 10 years, and that he was now back flush with cash, and he was going to buy a house and find a wife and live out his, his life in, in, in the Yanbian prefecture. We asked why he didn't just stay in South Korea after being there 10 years, and he said, well, there's a real sort of ethnic or sort of class divide. They considered us in Seoul and Busan as sort of like hillbillies, 
from China, even though we're Korean, which we thought was kind of interesting. He said it was more so for the men than the women. It was easier for a Chinese Korean to marry in, in Korea, a woman, than for a, a Chinese Korean male to go down there and expect to find a South Korean bride. There were some real class divisions. That's what they said anyway, which I thought was interesting. Again, just perceptions. Um, after we did, after spending a few days in Yanji, we made our way to Tumen City in this area right here, number two. This is a fantastically interesting place, especially while we were there, because what happened, this is also the area where the two female journalists were taken in this Tumen region area, you know, Lisa Ling, and this is terrible, I can never remember her counterpart's name. It's, that's not fair, I guess, to her, but, um, or, you know, and, and if you followed their story, you know, they were captured, what, five, six months ago, or six, seven months ago, and they spent five months in captivity and were released with a special visit from Bill Clinton. Um, but, and they just wrote their story out, and they said that they did, in fact, cross into North Korea, across the ice, but then made it back across, then were, the, were drugged back across the ice and captured. And they were there doing a story on the plight of female Korean refugees coming into China, what was happening to them. A lot of them get sold or end up in the sex industry, uh, sex slave industry, basically. Uh, and they were doing a story on the, the plight of female refugees. It's also a very relatively open border. This is the Tumen River Bridge, and that's looking right into North Korea. And you can't really see it, but you could just get your binoculars and stand on the side and check it out. And um, there was a stronger military presence, of course, as you might find in any border area than there was in Yanji. But um, it was fairly low key. But again, on the Chinese side, there was no direct sort of, this is your you know, North Korean propaganda station, or there were no slogans for North Korea. It was just Koreans. In fact, we talked to a lot of uh, Yanbian Chinese Koreans, and they said over and over, you know, we said, well, do you look to South Korea or North Korea? And they said, well, we're just Korean. We look to Korea. But we don't exactly like this regime in the North because that guy's a nut. And we'd hear this statement over and over. And of course, again, with this remittance economy and the relations and direct flights from South Korea, the ties to the South were much stronger than we ever envisioned they would have been. Um, also, we were there, great timing. We got into Beijing the day of the nuclear test and ended up in two men the day after. And talking to people there in two men said it was, they just thought it, an earthquake had occurred. Um, and it turned out to be the nuclear test. So it was, it was an interesting time to be there. A lot was going on. Um, as far as, you know, as far as uh, politically, and of course all the hubbub about the capture of these American journalists, and that was still ongoing. Our next uh, part of the trip, we extend to Hunshan City area. And that's area six here. And you'll see this, and to use this sort of terminology we understand, the narrow neck of land right there. Um, that's the tip where Korea and Russia cut off China to the sea. This was really an interesting part of the journey. One, we went up to um, this area right through here and went into the Russian border post and then backtracked back and followed it along. But this highway here is really interesting. This is, this is the border. This fence about five, three or four meters from the road is the North Korean-China border. On the other side, literally another five meters off the road, is the Russian side of the border. So for about 30 kilometers, China, and our driver said, China only owns the road. That's it. You could touch North Korea and walk 30 meters and touch Russia. And it was really fascinating. And apparently the Russians had lost some, or not lost, but fought some major battles in this area here during World War II against the Japanese, and they just built a lot of blood in this sort of sacred Russian land. And, if, you know, at the time, Mao and the nationalists, they were still duking it out for China. They weren't really in any position, so any position to sort of get that territory back. And so it's kind of, I guess there's some tension regarding that. But they've kept this little area open right along the Tumen River. And I have some <coughs> close-up pictures just to show you again. This is the bridge, another bridge going into North Korea. So this is the North Korean side. And these are Chinese um, river patrol boats, military patrol boats here. And uh, there was not much going on, but they were there. There was a naval river, riverine presence. There was a, a, lots of ground troops uh, doing road marches, not with full rut gear, but with, a, with their Kalashnikovs, with their assault rifles, up and down the road in uh, company 120, 100, you know, and platoon and company size strength. But, so there was a sprinkling of military activity. 
And this is the most, I mean, I keep saying it keeps getting more interesting, but it honestly does keep getting more interesting because this is the farthest point out. And this is the Chinese border post, this is the Russian border post, and this is the railway line between Russia and North Korea. That's where, that's where China ends. You'll see the border fence here and a border fence here. And that's the end of China. They don't quite make it to the sea. So, in fact, the map here is wrong because it shows that China comes right out to the sea in that point. Most maps are. But it just ends right there. And again, to get there, you drive through 30 miles of just nothing but the road is Chinese. You have barbed wire fences on each side, Korea and Russia. It's really an interesting place um, politically. And Eric Heyer, Professor Heyer, was very interested in this location because he's doing a book right now on border issues. And this is interesting to look at how this border was shaped. So we got back. We went back around because it took us a while, a few days to do this trip. And a few days later, we set out for the Longjing City or the Heaven Lake area. Um, and this is another just it's a really interesting place. And again, it's a place of pilgrimage for Koreans, South Koreans, because they have movement of travel and they can fly in DNG. When we were there, I mean, there must have been 10,000 people there at Heaven Lake, and I would say 90% or more were, were Korean coming to see this. In fact, there was a joke that was going around. We talked to some, and they said, you know, this is the two things Koreans agree on. The Heaven Lake should be Korean, but it's Chinese. So um, it's supposed to be, you know, the, the, the North Korean leader was supposedly born on the slopes of this mountain. Of course, you know, that's part of the legend. Uh, but another really interesting cultural point for the Korean community. So with that, the other thing I thought was interesting, because I'm always looking, this is the, you know, I you read, if you read the bio or you listen to Corey, I come from sort of a military research analyst sort of mindset, and so I'm always looking for things. So when we flew into Yenji, what was interesting, this is my shot of the Yenji airport as we're flying out, or flying in. There's these uh, J-7 interceptor aircraft all over. And I didn't do enough homework beforehand. I didn't realize it was a dual use military and civilian airport. I've never seen that in China. And honestly, I've flown all, I've flown dozens and dozens of airports. And so I know they exist, I'm sure, because here is one. But it's the first time I've ever flown in on the civilian side and looked over at a squadron of fighters on the other side. And so here you can see these satellite imagery pictures. Here's three of these J-7. And here's their like parking spots just off the edge of this airfield. They take this runway here, which I, and, um, blew this up again, and there's a whole bunch more. This is satellite imagery. Now, here's the fascinating thing, and it comes back to, I mean, if I can diverge a little bit, to the uh, F-22 debate. Everybody wants to develop a fifth-generation fighter, the, the, which is what the F-22 is. <laughs> this J-7 is a MiG-21. It came into service in 1966. It's a piece of crap. I mean, it's got updated avionics and flight control systems and things like this, but I mean, we would have to bring back the F-4 Phantom to even try to reduce ourselves to the parity on that level. Now, this isn't to say this is the Chinese Air Force. They have lots of different aircraft. They do field Sukhoi Su-27s, and they are working on their own fifth-generation fighter, an F-22 equivalent, but their engines keep burning up. They can't do this sub the supersonic, supersonic cruise. The engines don't last. But it's interesting that China still flies over 500 of these in their current Air Force. It's an interceptor with no air-to-air -air refueling. It's basically a homeland defense weapon because you can't take it anywhere. I mean, you could hit Korean targets. You could hit things that are in range, but you can't refuel this like a modern fleet like the US F-16s, F-A-18s. Every one of them is air-to-air -air fuel capable, even the Warthog, the A-10, if there's a ground attack aircraft. Anyway, it's an interesting side of the debate because I always hear like, well, China's building this like fifth generation attack, you know, this fighter aircraft. If we don't have the F-22, we're doomed. I don't know, it's just something to think about. <clears throat> but again, that's because I'm a military geek. I like to think about those kind of things. But now, what I want to do is get back to, again, the, the issue, the primary issue why we were there. We've been talking to the Kennedy Center for a while and, and doing about this, doing this program called Create the Last Divide of State. And really what we're looking at is the concept of the big three. If there's a big three left anymore, we're looking at this as the Cold War big three, Vietnam, Germany, and Korea. Vietnam solved itself through military action, through violent action, right? Germany reunified under peaceful conditions. What we wanted to look at is why is Korea not unified? But maybe more importantly, what are the implications of unification? What if it did occur? What can we expect? What are the issues? And there's a million different ways you can go about this. About 10, well, like, actually it was right about time of the German reunification, Columbia University did a study 
about uh, Korean reunification under the uh, directorship of Mike Young. You might know he's the uh, president of the University of Utah now. The report was never published, but it's an interesting it's an interesting concept of just looking at all the regional players and looking at all the issues. And of course, to do that, we have to come up with and explore the tragedies of the Korean split. And one of the things we heard, and again, these are just way, certain ways to look at it because you can debate these things, which all these issues are debatable. There's, you know, but the idea that I heard people say that the Korean split was the biggest, the bigger victory for China because of the whole history of Korean Peninsula. They had some period of warfare with Japan, but over 200 documented battles and skirmishes, conflicts with China, their other neighbor. But in the end, it's sort of a win for China. That is only one way of looking at the situation. But the split has definitely been a tear in, in the nation of the Korean, the Korean nation, not the state, but the nation. And so we want to we look at that a little bit. We also want to look at oppression, obviously, a little bit about the regime. And I put a couple things up here because, again, I like to look at historical parallels. And you can't transfer identical, you can't, in other words, if there's something going on in Iraq, you can't have a, it won't be the same in Korea, but take this into consideration. They say that as many as one-fifth, or as much as one-fifth of the North Korean population might be involved in a spy-informant type relationship. What that means is they're spying on their neighbors for the regime. Maybe they're each spying on each other for the regime. When, Iraq, when, when the U.S. invaded Iraq and they opened up the Ba'ath file documents, well, when they opened them up, they covered them, they started translating, it turned out that everybody in Iraq was a Ba'athist, especially every Sunni. And that was a big cause of concern when we started thinking of the post-war peace in Iraq. And also a social concern because what happens if those numbers or those names get out and you find out, well, they were spying on me, they were spying on me, they were spying. There's a certain amount of social unrest that occurred in Afghan Iraq. Now, again, it's, it's, just an, it's just something to consider, the implications of reuni one singular implication of reunification in Korea because you'll have to deal with that at some point. Um, it also has a huge army, the fourth largest in the world, and it seems to be very, very capable or capable enough, and it certainly has the numbers. So these are things that we have to sort of consider when you think about any sort of reunification. And again, I'm just mentioning a couple of things that we're sort of developing. I like the economic angle probably best. In this satellite photo, I know you've probably seen these. They're, they're just, they're wonderful because you look at all the, the power in South Korea and then you look at North Korea and it's, it's dark. And that's just what it looks like from space. I've seen other images where you see Pyongyang and it's got some light on a couple little spots, but I mean, you really don't have much light in North Korea. I mean, when you think about it, the split, I just read the other day that South Korea, that area had a GDP less than Bangladesh, and it's risen to the 13th largest economy in the world. And North Korea is, like a lot of these places, these other uh, totalitarian regimes are sputtering along, and I guess it's the 95th, so it's not the worst. but. Um, Again, you have to think of the economic consequences, or there's a lot of economic consequences, and some of those um, are even go back to oppressive. I mean, I think one of the things is all the reports of the lack of good diet, iodine, things like that, and recent reports that the military just dropped the height requirement in North Korea. The military dropped the height requirement for the third time to accommodate shorter, smaller soldiers. And you know, and I've heard people say that you know, if there's a younger generation there that's basically starving to death, or a generation, and, and if reunification occurs, you could actually end up having to care for five million idiots because they're not, the mental capacities aren't developed because they're not getting the nutrients they need to grow mentally, like that we just take for granted. These are huge implications as far as like global aid, what would it would take to actually unify, or, or what it would take to integrate North Korea into one unified Korea. And you know, then look at the other hand, maybe the North, we're looking at this from our perspective, the North Korean regime is probably like they think South Korea is going to fold into them. That's a joke to us, but you know, these, everybody's got their own way of looking at these things. What we want to do is go around and look at the regional implications for South Korea, China, Japan, the United States. And I want to use some of the German reunification lessons as a model because, again, there's some really interesting ones. And I, I wanted to do, I think I'd like to, I'll just highlight a couple. And one is um, economic implications for uh, South Korea, and I want to use the, the German model for a second. When German reunification occurred, there was a fear of a massive tidal wave of East German refugees floating into West Germany. That's 
pretty good concern. That's probably pretty likely. I mean, everybody in the West, hey, you know, we're enlightened. We have everything. We have the stronger economy. Why wouldn't they flow our way? And um, the coal government decided that they would peg the West German mark or the East German mark to the West German mark to create for these people in East Germany a sense of stability, that you don't have to come over to West Germany. Your mark is as secure as our mark. So your livelihood, your savings, you don't have to rush here to save your life economically. You can stay there, and if you had 60,000 East German marks, it's now 60, West, the value of 60,000 Western marks. That was huge for stemming that, that tidal wave, what they thought of people coming in, because they thought their, their money would be worthless. Their livelihoods would be worth nothing. Now, it's easy to make those decisions, but the second, third, and fourth order of effects are much harder to determine. What immediately happened was they realized in the West German government that all of a sudden their monetary policy was tied to East German monetary policy because they, the, they pegged their currency to the East German mark. So it's interesting. I was talking to some of the uh, people that led this Bush's, Bush Senior's reunification team. He had a team of legal advisors on German reunification. And they were working with the Germans, and they thought reunification would take years. And one guy in the panel said, it'll take less than a year. It took nine months to reunify Germany by law. Why? Because when it came to the economic conditions, there's no way the West German government, the powerhouse that it was, was going to tie their whole currency and fiscal policy to the East German mark and decisions the East German government would make. And so, but the, and so what happens is there's these implications we can't think of. What happens if North Korea, the border goes down with North and South Korea? Do the North Koreans sit there on their, where they're at, or do they come across the border? <coughs> Conventional wisdom says they come across the border. Now, Germany had a four to one advantage, West Germany over East Germany. So, so they could basically, if they had to, could have absorbed, would have been awful, but they could have absorbed 25% their population again and, and somehow made it work. Korea's two to one. I'm not saying every North Korean is gonna come, but when you think about what could happen, if all those North Koreans flood over into Seoul, which is very close to the border, these places, what happens to South Korea? What happens to Seoul? On the other hand, what do you do to stem that tide? Do you deploy South Korean troops to kill or battle North Korean refugees that want to flood across the border? That's not going to work. So what's the mechanism to put in place that you can even consider a sort of manageable unification? So the result is, and for many other considerations, you have a lot, and, and again, just on the surface, a lot of rhetoric in South Korea, but no real policy toward unification in South Korea, in my opinion. It's, easy the way, it's easier the way it is. Now, and the other security implication for Japan I thought was really interesting. Um, any unification of Korea would lead to a reassessment and redefining, or maybe even doing away with altogether, the treaties that exist regarding the Korean Peninsula, including Japan. And, and what's really something we've been looking at is this would reverberate throughout the region. Um, any move to reunify, if China was going to accept, would almost automatic would come with, you, ha, you know, an automatic request to remove U.S. troops from the peninsula. Once you remove U.S. troops from the Korean peninsula, you probably have Japan requesting the same. Public opinion in Japan favors the removal of U.S. troops from Japanese territory. Um, and there's already, you know, there's, we're under, we're ongoing moving people, uh, forces out of Okinawa to Guam, et cetera, et cetera. So you would probably get the same sort of request from Japan. What does that do to Japan? Well, Japan over the last, you know, as you know, from the treaties post-World War II treaty, Japan is obliged to have a self-defense force, but not an offensive capability. Well, back in, let's look at World War I. When they put the machine gun, it was heavy on a tripod. It was considered a defensive weapon because it was on a tripod and it was hard to move. Well, once the firepower became more mobile and you could sling that over your shoulder, the machine gun was an offensive weapon. So the weapon itself isn't offensive or defensive. It's tucked into a strategy and doctrine that makes it offensive and defensive. What's interesting in Japan is they've done a number of things. They've just reauthorized the Special Forces Program. Now, again, during a period of terrorism, counterterrorism, which is sort of like the calling card today, Special Forces are important because that provides homeland security. But Special Forces can also do really quick and nasty things all over the world quickly. That's why they're special. That's why we use them. In, that's why we, the United States, use them in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in the Philippines, and everywhere else we go, Georgia. Um, they've also maintained a civilian satellite launching program, which is in many respects part of the foundation of an ICBM program. They've also just uh, um, approved and are working on an aircraft carrier 
And again, an aircraft carrier is a power projection weapon. The, uh, pa when you think about that, you're putting all your arsenal on a platform and you sail it out. It is an offensive weapon. If you take the arsenal, the weapons load, the capability of a U.S. carrier battle group, it could wipe out many, medium, and all small nations, one carrier battle group in the world. And it could get there quickly, and it could get there to do it. That's what it does. It projects power. In fact, I was thinking, I was talking to um, Admiral Woodward, who was the British commander in charge of the Falkland invasion. And years and years ago, I was at a fireside with him and when I was going to school in London. And he says, you know, I appreciate you Americans because we couldn't have won the Falkland War without you. He said, because over the years we've decimated our capability. We have no power projection anymore. We don't have any carrier battle groups. We can't move what it takes to fight a war halfway across, you know, we couldn't even move it across the Atlantic. We had to have U.S. help to do that, to project our power. Once we're in place, we can, we can fight the fight, but we couldn't do it. So they needed U.S. help. That and intelligence assets. Um, but anyway, going back to that, and also what's interesting, so Japan is basically rearming, let's face it. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting to me is that Japan, I think, was relegated to 100,000 troops by the post-World War II Treaty. Basically, it said you have to have a self-defense force, but you can only have 100,000 troops. Let's use another historical example that I think is really interesting. At the post-Treaty of Versailles, the German government was allocated or given permission for how many troops? An army of 100,000. So what did the German army do? They stripped out all the deadbeats, all the losers, all the underperformers, and they put the cream of the crop and the officer corps into what became the German army. You're talking about von Manstein, Erwin Rommel, Heinz Guderian. These guys were the geniuses of their time. When Hitler began to remilitarize Germany, all they did was fill it out with conscripts. It had the best officer corps in the world and arguably the best army in the world in 1939. For sure, when you think about the kill ratios of the German army, what they did on the Russian front, and what they did, you know, I mean, it was amazing. Japan is in a very similar situation. They have a fantastic army, a fantastic officer corps. It only takes filling that stuff out. Again, these are just implications that will change the whole regional composition. If, if, if something like reunification occurs, U.S. troops pull off the peninsula. And finally, the last thing will happen is, almost without a doubt, in my opinion, Japan will go nuclear very quickly, publicly. They have a pile of plutonium. They have the ability to do that. They have a satellite launching system, and they aren't going to be the only ones in the region without a nuclear capability. And a unified Korea will have a nuclear capability. China already has a nuclear capability, and you're going to have a regional arms race. These are huge implications for the region and totally will reset the balance of power. So in this strange way, there's lots of reasons why unification isn't the best option. When we think about the oppression and the poor tragedies and the things that are going on in North Korea, almost every one of these countries is kind of happy with the status quo in many ways. And again, I'm only pointing out little bits and pieces, and, there, and these are things that we can argue back and forth, but I just wanted to sort of like get you to think about some of these issues. Um, but those are just a couple of the examples of things that we want to sort of explore in this film. And again, one of the reasons we went to this Yanbyon area on the Korean border was that we don't know what our access will be to North Korea. Uh, and if we do have access, if it'll be so heavily managed that all we do is get a shot of the parade grounds outside the hotel, we're not really sure, excuse me. But there is a Kore this Korean identity in China was a very valuable stop, I think, in identifying Korean nationalism and ethnicity on the peninsula. So at that, I think I'd like to I'll close, and I've sort of thrown out some things that are kind of provocative, may seem totally ridiculous to you, and if you have any questions or comments or you want to discuss it, I would love to do that. So. Okay. If there's none, I'll drink my Perrier and go back and buy a Brigham Young psychedelic t-shirt. Yes? Uh, every once in a while I see a something on the internet that says that China has their, eye, their eyes on North Korea. And if North Korea falters or fails or anything, China is going to be ready to take over North Korea. Do you ever hear anything uh, like that? Well, you know, one, I should probably defer to Mark Peterson here on some of these questions. He's the Korean expert here. But one thing I will say, is, which I thought was interesting, is that on the regarding the nuclear test blast, I think you saw the harshest language to date come out of the North Korean uh, Chinese 
upper leadership, the chief, uh, they're basically the chief of staff, came out very strongly against the test. I, I don't know, I don't, and, and Eric and I were talking about that, that's stronger language against North Korea than in the past. One thing that, if they folded, I don't think China would take it over like a, like a state or protectorate, but I think they'd want to manage expectations on their frontier. Every country has an interest in that. Um, I guess one of the, it, I don't know the answer to that. I think if it was done, it depends on, how, I think, how it's done. If they saw that the West is doing land grab in Korea, which I don't think we would ever do, then I think you would have that happen. But there's so many different factors and things that would have to play out for them. It's an option. Mark, do you have any comment on that? Um, I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, <laughs> I, no, that's, that's, that's okay. um, yeah, I, th I think you're right. I don't think China would want to take over North Korea. I don't know if I see those things, too. I don't know that it makes any sense. Yeah. China. Uh, historically, it's interesting to see some of the arguments that come out of China regarding uh, early history of that region. And it came to a, a boiling point about two years ago, maybe three years ago, when uh, North, when China put in for UNESCO recognition of some early sites in China that Korea claims as part of Korea. Uh, the, the key word is Koguryo, the old Koguryo state, which was clearly ethnically Korea, but clearly geographically China. And uh, the way China has gone uh, to war intellectually with Korea over Koguryo is really interesting. That China wants Koguryo, and they claim Koguryo. Um, but I don't know that that would translate into uh, modern over North Korea. That doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, I, I don't see it at all. I don't see what they're, the bad, and you know what, actually I don't think they want the mess. That's the, you know, and that's the thing, if you look at what the, the regime and the, the state of things in Korea, that's the problem, that's why status quo works for everybody in the region, really. Because do you really want to inherit that mess? I mean, think of the global aid package it would be to rescue North Korea. I mean, oh, I think, he, sorry. You know, yeah, there is problems with illegal immigration. In fact, if we go to two men, into this area, two men, of course, and I wrote this down, that's the location of different prisons and um, detention facilities for refugees that get caught. And then basically, from what I understand, they're kind of rounded up by the Chinese, and every so often the North Koreans come in and just take them back. And they don't, it's a bad ending. So there are problems. In fact, our driver, you know, we pointed out three major crossing points for refugees in the area. We drove past these areas to look at that, which is part of the story that the, the female journalists were doing, Lisa Ling and her counterpart, you know, on, well, on female illegal immigration, but refugees coming across the border there, too. Um, my question is twofold. When you're in the Yangon uh, Korean Autonomous Prefecture, mm -hmm. Uh, to go backwards first, I don't know what their implications would be. Again, I think it would have to be shaped how, by how the unification occurs, I think, all those questions. As far as like how they felt about unification, I don't know if I got a good enough survey of that. Um, they clearly, every single person thought like North Korea, that was just a mess. Uh, so they felt like the change was welcome there. The other thing that happened while we were there, and I guess, again, it was a timely trip. The South, former South Korean leader died. And every time we went into a house in these villages, we just kind of walked around and invited ourselves in. Everybody was tuned into this funeral procession. I mean, everybody, all the TV stations and the Korean barbecue restaurants, which, you know, Yanbyan is full of Korean barbecue restaurants. That It was fantastic. I ate so good while I was there. But um, it was all tuned into this political event, this uh, death and funeral of this former South Korean leader. There was a lot of interest in that. So 
I don't know necessarily what the feeling about unification or if they feel, I think they probably, you know, there was some sort of, like it would be easier, it would be nice, because one of the things that was interesting in two men here, this, they have a, a um, sort of a suitcase economy going across this bridge. And we watch people walk across all day long with their suitcases of just stuff. And we were told that Chinese can walk across the bridge and they'll have contacts over there and they'll sell their suitcase full of stuff and it goes into like little markets or illegal stores or whatever in or North Korea. But North Koreans weren't really coming across. But Chinese day traders were. And so I think maybe if it was a more open border, but you know, you just don't know if China would ever open that border anyway. By so. Chinese, you mean Korean ethnic Chinese? Korean ethnic Chinese and, Chi and Han Chinese. Chinese citizens, it seemed that both were able to cross because that's what we ask. But it was always one way, and then they would come back. We sat there most of the day to watch and people come back, but the people weren't coming in that were just. What were they trading? You know, just notepads and pencils and food, and it was just two suitcases. What and just, I don't know. Who knows? I don't know. That's true. I don't know. That's a good question. A couple guys we saw that came back came back empty handed. I don't know. Or not with material, not with uh, commodities or anything? It's a good question. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. That's right. What do they, what does North Korea lead in or counterfeiting U.S. dollars and... Hey, which funeral are you talking about? Which funeral are you talking Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. Kim Dae Jung and Noam Lee Young, they both died this last summer. Kim, uh... Let's see, it was May 20, let's see, when was that? May was no, no one Yeah, that's, is that right? Yeah. It was weird because, you know, we're in Yenji, every, and every station in the hotel room was in Korean, <laughs> so neither of us could understand it. And, you know, so we had to get our news from other places, but um, from the internet and things like that, but it was pretty interesting to have everybody, the hotel, everybody tuned into that. How was the internet there? It was fine. In, you know, in, in spots, and there's internet cafes everywhere. It's a very open city in Yenji. I was really surprised because we talked to different people who say that the state security apparatus, Chinese security apparatus is there trying to work against these um, groups that harbor North Korean refugees, things like that. Uh, in fact, apparently, and this is things we've just been hearing, it's hard to verify that when Lisa Ling was caught, and maybe you've heard more about this, and they, her producer was caught by the Chinese authorities. And some of those tapes and things landed up in the Chinese authorities' hands. They went through the tapes, took it all, and basically started rounding up people. So they rounded up a lot of people in Yanji and two men, and now they're in prison. Because they were aiding the underground network of North Korean uh, refugees. So it's kind of tragic. So there was a lot of hands. I'm not sure. Sorry. When you were uh, traveling along this, uh, this border, was there a lot of uh, North Korea propaganda villages? Zero. Zero North Korea. I mean, zero reference to North Korea that we could see. That, that was probably the most immediate surprise to us. But again, when we started, we, we would just go off the road and go into these, go up the little road and go into a village and just like start walking the village and start talking to people. And they all kind of had the same thing. Ah, oh, North Korea, pff, it's all about South Korea. And that's for my grandkids making money that sends me home every week, you know, every month. It was an important. And we said, you know, it's interesting they look back at fondness because Eric was always interested in the Chinese angles. He goes, what do you think of the Chinese government? And he said, we love the government here because they saved us from the Japanese. So I don't know exactly what those relations were and how much they did, but there's a sort of idea, idea that Mao's government, you know, liberated them, so to speak, and they feel like they've been treated okay. They have their own sort of autonomy and everything's in Korean, so. Yes. Okay. So, and I'll be here after if I can answer any questions. I'd be happy to stay. You know, that's a good question. We talked to a couple, but honestly, just a couple. Uh, and they were both taxi drivers. And um, they said, yeah, no, no big deal. So I said, so, you know, they said they kind of do their thing, we do our thing, but we all just do the Chinese thing. But they were strong, they kind of, and I take that back, they were also strong to point, you know, quick to point out that, hey, we're all Chinese, you know. So I don't know if that could speak for the Koreans, but. They seemed to, it seemed to be, like I say, we, it was amazing how I think open it was uh, to us, you know, because um, at the same time, there was also problems cracking down in Western China. Most of my travel up to this point had been in Western China. I like to go to Urumqi and, and Kashgar and Tuskegon and, and stay with the Uyghurs a lot, and there's always tension there. So I guess I expected there to be tension here, and there wasn't. 
nothing is noticeable. At that, I think I have to close because I have to be out, but if I'd be happy to stay around and answer any questions. Thank you so much for attending and have a good day.